Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters, where we live stream every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, unless otherwise noted. Um, so Coffee with the Critters is getting ready to turn five years old next month. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the work we do, my name is Laura Joseph. I'm owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people all over the world um, how to understand applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement um, with the animals in our care. We do that through our live streaming services and um, our focus and our mission is empowering people in the, in the people empowering animals and the people that care for them. Um, so thank you for joining us this morning. We have another great episode. Um, thank you to uh, Jim Gillis, who has been on here with us before from the UK. He's helped put this together. Uh, before we get started, we have a couple of guests joining us, but let me talk about a few things that have happened in the past week. And for those of you that may be new to the work we do. So on our Facebook page, you can find out um, all our future events um, to the left of the screen, um, all upcoming events, workshops, what have you. Uh, you can also sign up for our email newsletter list through there. And you can, where we try to send out an email newsletter every two weeks, but I'll tell you, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> uh, you can also find out about the work we do on our website, which is theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, and in mentioning that, uh, the Animal Behavior Center, Friday turned seven years old. Um, so seven years ago, the Animal Behavior Center didn't even exist. Um, and the reason I put the Animal Behavior Center, um, our mission is, like I said, empowering people, animals and the people that care for them um, is I was, I, I uh, adopted in an animal that was going to be put to sleep for behavior issues and behaviors labeled as aggressive. Um, I put myself back through school taking master level classes and applied behavior analysis to do better for this particular animal. And he is currently the mascot of our center, which you see right there. Um, on our homepage. So um, the work that we do here is international. We have membership programs, level one for companion animals, for people who wanna know how to do better um, using applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement, and we make it very easy to understand. We also have our projects, which are species specific, um, for people who want to learn more about working particularly with deaf dogs, parrots, pigs, um, and more. Um, our level two um, is more for professionals that want to get in the field of applied animal behavior. Uh, last night we had in the amazing um, Samantha Saren. She has her master's in applied behavior analysis and also a board certified behavior analyst. We talked about digging deeper into no reward markers. Um, so if you want to find out anything more about the work that we do, you can go to our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. You can also reach me personally via email at laura, L-A-R-A, -A, at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. So without further ado, uh, we have two guests coming on today. The amazing Jim Gillis from the UK, professional dog trainer, um, also focusing on behavior. Um, we're getting ready to bring him on. He helped put this uh, um, episode together today. Um, we also have um, the amazing Michael Shikashio. Mike, am I saying your last name correctly? Great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've heard about Mike. I've read about Mike. Um, and today I'm having my first live stream conversation with him. So today we are going to talk about the muzzle up project so i could try to explain it to you but instead let me bring on the professionals and they can give you more information about that good morning jim and mike thanks for joining us here good morning, morning. Um, good morning. 
So I'll give just a brief, um, read a brief bio on both of you. So, um, and you could probably better give more information on what you do and how you do, how you do it. Um, so Michael is a certified dog behavior consultant, is the past president of the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, IAABC, and provides private consultations working exclusively with dog aggression cases through his business, aggressivedog.com. Michael is fully certified through the IAABC and is a full member of the Association of Professional Dog Trainers, APDT. Um, I do want to read this because it's impressive. Um, he's sought after for his expert opinion by new, numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, New York Post, Baltimore Sun, WebMD, um, and many other magazines. Did I get that correct, Mike? You did. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Great. You're very welcome. Um, Jim Gillis, a certified dog behavior consultant for the past seven years. Jim has worked with clients and their dogs on a wide range of behavior problems. In 2018, Jim joined a, leani, a leading animal welfare charity as behavior officer, working in his post-adoption support in the rescue sector. Jim uses scientific evidence-based approaches to training and behavior modifications. These include the use of the most up-to-date methods, which utilize force-free methods, focusing exclusively on humane and non-aversive techniques. Did I get that accurate, Jim? You did. Good job. <laughs> Three cups of coffee in this morning. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Jim and Mike, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the Muzzle Up Project? I know, Jim, you've talked about it before. I've heard you mention it before in the past. Do you want to tell us how it started, why it started, and why it's important for people to know about this? Sure. I'll maybe let Mike go into more of the, the background. He's maybe more familiar with the history of the Muzzle Up project, but it was something that was very close to my heart, something that we would recommend to the dog owners as a really valuable resource across the board for muzzle training. Really useful and practical videos, content, just a, a great site all in all, but Mike will know more about the kind of history and give you more detail of that, if that's okay, Mike. Sure, yeah. Um, it was uh, originally founded by Maureen Backman, who uh, saw the need for educating the public about muzzles and advocating for uh, the use of muzzles. And uh, she approached me uh, last year to take it, take the project over. And of course, I said, oh, absolutely, uh, jumped at the chance to be able to continue the message. So um, I brought in a wonderful team of positive reinforcement based trainers, including Jim, uh, Kayla Fratt and Dave Grodin, Sarah McManaman and the wonderful Deb Jones um, are all part of the team. So uh, they've helped me and I've got to give them all, all much of the credit because they've been doing so much work in promoting it and just uh, maintaining the Instagram channel and the website and the, uh, the Facebook page. So uh, and then it's and we're just continuing the message. And um, if anybody's interested, if people are on Instagram, too, they can look up the hashtag muzzle up project which uh, interestingly enough, it was, you know, Maureen had started an Instagram page and I, you know, Kayla and I were like looking at it, Sarah and I were looking at it because they're like big Instagram people. And, um, and I saw that it was like, you know, the 30 followers or something like that. But this hashtag muzzle up project had taken up this huge following. There's over 5,000 posts on that hashtag. So um, I said, wow, it's amazing. So we started to really build the, build the awareness there. But again, it's all, it's all about advocating for uh, why muzzles don't have to be a bad thing for dogs and all the, the, the myths, really. Yeah, and I was reading on the Muzzle Up Project's website um, right before I had both of you on, and um, I saw that Deb Jones was a part of it. You can hear on Coffee with the Critters, are very familiar with Deb Jones. Um, because muzzles have or did have, probably still do, a stigma attached to them, and it doesn't always mean what people think. Um, I thought when I was reading that on, um, on the website because it said dogs may wear muzzles because they eat stones or toxic um, substances so it helps keep your animals safe. Absolutely. Um, and it also like I know a lot of times when I was reading on there a lot of times people will put dogs on their harness that says do not approach 
Um, it'll say deaf dog on there. P people don't always pay attention to that. And I think um, I liked what I was reading on the website. When you see a muzzle on a dog, that can be a clear communicator. Give this dog space. Yeah. Um, so anything, I mean, anything in addition you want to say about um, the Muzzle Up project? Um, what exactly, what's the mission? Uh, maybe I'll let Jim uh, take on some of that because I know he's, he also, it's interesting the culture of muzzles too in different countries, people perceive them differently. Some places they're very normal to see and some places they're unheard of. So maybe Jim can speak about that from where he's from. Sure, yeah, I would agree that they are lately stigmatized. So you see a dog with a muzzle and you form a kind of judgment of that mm -hmm. dog, um, which is, you know, probably yeah, un unfair in the dog because as you identify, there's lots of reasons why a dog will wear a muzzle. It's not always about aggression. But, um, I kind of view it as a, as a life skill for dogs, you know, to have this in place. And there's probably no, no inappropriate way for going through muzzle training with a dog. It has so many practical applications from vet checks to preventing some unwanted behavior um, to, to obviously aggression where, as with any aggressive behavior, safety and management is your first port of call um, with any of those types of behaviors. So it has a wide range of applications, but it should be viewed maybe as a life skill that we should be working with all dogs to incorporate muzzle training into their early development. And the Muzzle Up Project, I think, is just a fantastic resource for that. Totally free and educational. Um, something that's widely accessible and, and just a fantastic resource generally. Yeah, and uh, it kind of to segue on that too, the, you know, as Laura was mentioning how muzzles can keep people away from, from a muzzled dog, people will avoid that, but it really helps, I find in my cases when, uh, you know, the, the dog has a muzzle on and people, you always have the people that say, don't worry, I'm great with dogs and they stick yes. their hand on. It <laughs> helps to really, you're really advocating for the dog. So uh, that's how I kind of sell it to clients that have a little hesitancy and say, oh, muzzles, I don't know about that. They look like Hannibal Lecter. And uh, so I'll, I'll sell it said, well, you're, you're going to help your dog because especially if it's a fear-based case, there's, it's going to keep people away from petting the dog and it's going to really help that dog, you know, when it's out in public. So there's many benefits to it. Yeah. And with you saying that, Mike, um, it reminds me of when I got my my mo one of my most recent dogs um she's going to be seven years old that so that's how long ago um she came to me quincy our rottweiler and i was trying to expose her to different environments um for the well-being of her future and i remember i took her to a public event to slowly introduce her to people and it was the first time i had a dog in eight years Wow. And um, when I took her back, when I took her out into the public, everybody wanted to come at her and uh, touch her. And they were reaching for her face, reaching over her head. Um, and I knew prior to that, that she showed signs of not being comfortable with hands coming near her face. So I was prepared. I had her on a harness. I thought I was doing the best. I was doing the best with what I knew at the time. I had her on her harness and I would ask people, please don't approach my dog. Um, what I found out was that doesn't work very well alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like you said, people would say, oh, don't worry about it. Dogs love me. I'm great with dogs and I'm watching my dog's behavior. Um, so I quickly started learning within those couple of minutes, different things I needed to say um, to keep these people away from the away from the, away from my dog and let me introduce my dog to you um and uh, you know it, it just it kept happening so i was using the best that i had at the time and i saw the next couple coming to me trying to approach my dog mm -hmm. and the hands came out and i just said sometimes less is better i just said i wouldn't do that if i were you and that <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> she wasn't gonna hurt mm -hmm. them but I'm the one that's gonna have to walk away and, <clears throat> and, and work with these behaviors. Um, and counter condition what somebody unknowingly trained. 
So, yeah. I mean, if I were to walk in with a muzzle, um, I could probably, and I will now, use that as an educational tool to what you're seeing and why you're seeing and let me educate, share the education. Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, the, the thing that I always try also sell clients on is I'll, I'll take out a muzzle, right? And I'll say, you know, this is about 15 bucks. It's a lot cheaper than some of the six figure lawsuits that I am privy to either in expert witness work or in the cases that I see some people can't even get homeowners insurance. So I, it's a very quick selling point, especially if you have somebody that's uh, controlling the finances in the family. So this is a lot cheaper than losing your homeowners. So uh, another way of, uh, again, just, just you can easily sell clients that get stuck on, uh, I don't wanna do that or, you know, there's, there's a lot of stigmas about them. There is, um, and something that comes to mind that could be similar is the, the same thing as the stigma is creating your dog. Um, I know when we have people here in the center, our dogs usually go into the crates and I'll ask people do not approach the crates. And some of the things that I, one of the first things I hear is, oh, why do you have the dogs in the crate? I mean, <laughs> the dogs are comfortable in their crates. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so like the muzzle and the crate both have tend to have this stigma um, where I think it's due to either lack of knowing better currently or the way these items were used in the past mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, yeah do you either one of you want to uh, maybe yeah Jim could probably talk about some of the, the stigmas that he runs into with clients I'm sure yeah, yeah sure definitely that. for yeah. sure yeah you saw so you actually made a comparison earlier with some of the, the kind of high-vis harnesses or kind of do not approach type type um you know the kind of slips you put around the leads to stop people approaching a dog and what you tend to find with that is it's more of an attraction than anything else so somebody's more likely to come over when they see that type of thing out of curiosity or because they believe that they have some kind of intrinsic ability with dogs um, and a muzzle can provide that provide that deterrent but it can also give confidence to both the owner and the dog when when they know that nothing bad can happen and that can include going out for walks going for vet checks in particular i think a muzzle is just a fantastic tool that shouldn't be used as an emergency measure it should be used as a as i said earlier kind of life skill something your dog has in play that you can use as and when necessary if you like that it be yeah, over here there definitely is a stigma as well and i think the visual side of the basket muzzles i think you showed one earlier mike um, the basket bills they just look menacing particularly maybe not so much in a smaller dog but if you're working with you know one of the bigger breeds a german shepherd rottweiler and you see one of them with a muzzle on then it can be quite intimidating from a from a aesthetic perspective but it's a functionality which is important right so do you guys, we, I've got a, a couple of things I'm jotting down here to make sure we talk about and some, I don't know if you guys can see the comments coming up. Um, okay, good. Um, do you guys suggest every dog be trained to wear a muzzle? I think I pretty much know that answer, but. <laughs> and no, no harm in it, you know. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah, I like it for a, almost like a relationship building tool as well. So if we can get owners to work with a muzzle in a, in a positive way, then it can build, rebuild some bonds, you know, if that's been paired through for whatever reason, then just working with a muzzle is a really simple and safe piece of equipment to maybe restore some of those bonds. But because we're using positive methods and we can go through the kind of step-by-steps -step in terms of the positive methods, but, but generally I think it can repair the bonds and it's a great safety tool anyway. So that process of getting the owners into reward-based training and can, can be, a nice little add-on and a benefit from it. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, a couple of additional benefits. People are saying, "Well, my dog will never need a muzzle," but you never know. You know, accidents can happen. Dogs can get injured. Um, emergency situations. If you have to evacuate a certain area, you know, you, the dogs can be very scared in some of those uh, very stressful times. So we can't always predict future behavior. You know, based on what we're used to. So. Uh, it, it can be uh, very beneficial. The other thing too, as Jim was mentioning, is this building the relationship. I find that if I have a case where the dog has some issues like handling issues, doesn't like to be touched or nails trimmed, and we want that safety aspect, when people start to learn how to condition well, so they're 
creating a positive association with the muzzle, it's helping them learn to be better trainers or better teachers. And so they learn also, okay, this is how we slowly condition to a muzzle. Um, and the dog doesn't have a negative association with that to begin with, but they do with maybe nail trims or something. So if you get good at conditioning a muzzle, you're going to start that kind of lay that foundational aspect to getting good at nail trims or ear cleaning or whatever other husbandry exercises you might need to incorporate. So you come, you, it's good starter, starting training exercise for a lot of clients, I think. Yeah, and that muzzle, um, depending on how you train it, how you condition it, that muzzle can be a cue to the dog great things are getting ready to start happening. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So almost like a start button kind of uh, yeah. activity. Great, yeah. Great point. Yeah. yeah. So um, I wanted to, mix, um, Mike, you just talk, mentioned this, but Christy Darling says owners would need to be appropriately trained on how to yeah. muzzle train as to not create other undesired behaviors in their dog. So do you guys have any tips on for people watching or going to watch the replay as well. Um, now they're excited about muzzle training. Now they understand why it's important. Nobody plans an accident. Um, so, I mean, I know that from here, uh, muzzles are great in times and situations where there's an accident. You did not foresee this coming. Uh, put the muzzle on. Um, do you have any tips for people or where they can go like your websites to learn about how to train your dog to accept a muzzle or to want to put the muzzle, have the muzzle put on sure um jim you got i'm sure you have some resources too that you like to recommend sure my my first protocol was always a muzzle up project just because there was so much great content in there and i think from from a troubleshooting point of view muzzle training can be it can be a complex uh, process. It's not something where we can take a muzzle and simply fit it to a dog and, and kind of hope it goes well. We have to go through a procedure to make sure that, you know, the association's in place and the perception of the muzzle is, is a positive one. Um, and that is a relatively simple process, but it's always tailored for the individual. And that will vary from individual to individual. Um, and, and that's not even factoring in that there could be some negative emotion around the muzzle from previous learning. So we may have to undo some of that if there is a really negative perception, mainly because in those situations of emergency, a muzzle has been fitted without any prior work being done, no preparatory work. So the association may be, I'm in a vet practice, and the only time I get a muzzle put on is when horrible things have been done to me, you know, pain-related things have been done to me. So that mm. could form a really negative emotion, and we would maybe have to undo that, first of all. But if our dog that's seen it for the first time we can go through a really gradual build up process where you know we're just acclimatizing and we're associating it positively sometimes the most trickiest part and i tend to find this I'm not sure about for you guys but the, the clips in the class tends to be mm -hmm. one of the hardest parts getting the dog mm -hmm. to eat out of a muzzle can be a relatively straightforward process but as soon as you gesture as soon as you go to put those clasps on then problems yeah. start yeah and maybe that's um, a, a decent starting place from troubleshooting for the viewers is to maybe get around that part of it if you've got any tips there mike that would be more, more than welcome yeah um i think that's a, a really great point sometimes if you have to decide if the muzzle already has a negative association for the dog or if somebody's just slapped one on and that's why i always wait to tell my clients on how to acclimate a muzzle i don't usually tell them to get one ahead of time in my cases because uh, the worst thing that can happen is somebody slaps a muzzle on a dog just before I come over. <laughs> the association that occurs there, sure, it'll keep me safer, but I, I, I'm always advocating for the dog to make sure that they, they're they comfortable with what we're doing. So, um, but this, there's lots of resources. I mean, obviously the muzzle up project, but there's, we have the links to uh, videos of many great trainers have already done. Uh, Chirag Patel's a wonderful video. I, I like his way of going through it methodically, and especially in cases where there is a negative association already. I have a video on there that's a, it's sort of the lazy trainer's <laughs> version of muzzle acclimation because it's just letting the dog kind of do the work. The, the muzzle becomes conditioned like a, almost like a new Kong toy. Uh, Deb Jones, of course, has some great stuff. So uh, there's lots of options on YouTube. People can easily search that up. And that's what I do. I send, I send my clients links to those videos so they can see the process. And, and most do, you know, a pretty decent job after watching the videos and going through and understanding it. So, yeah. yeah. And 
Mike, before you go any further with people um, sending people to YouTube to look for links, I would definitely go to either one of your websites first so you know what links you're looking for. Um, and I'll, I'll post both of your websites real quick. Um, Mike's website, aggressivedog.com and Jim's website, cbtdogbehavior.com. Notice the, um, the spelling of behavior. So, um, sorry, Mike, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, no I, worries. Um, we're, we're probably like there's, there's, on YouTube. There's a couple of, I've got in my resources section on my website, um, a couple, okay. one on how to acne, but also one on how to feed through muzzles. So sometimes people get muzzles, you know, this is so this is a boomer's muzzle, right? It's a, if I can get that in the camera, right? Uh, it's a custom muzzle, um, which I've, I've customized all additionally to create a treat hall here, but sometimes that's hard to get a treat through. So you have different types of muzzles, like, uh, this one's a, a Jaffco. It's got the <laughs> treat hall there. Um, but that can be hard to get regular, you know, with we're using, um, like treats, cut up treats, it's hard to get that. So I've got a video on there also shows how to use food tubes and different ways of feeding through something like this where it's hard to get treats through. Because that, a little side note too, some dogs, <coughs> if I'm working with them and I'm trying to feed a treat through there, I've become, you know, as I'm feeding treats, I my hand sometimes, or the person's hand, if the dog's sensitive to that, I'm lingering around there a little longer than I would if there was no muzzle on, right? So if there's no muzzle on, we can do very fast reinforcement. With this, we sometimes have to like figure out and now our hand's lingering in there more and that, that can create issues for the dog as well if in the beginning stages. So, uh, so food tubes can be very helpful to get over that. Do you guys have Primula cheese over, over your way? Do you know the uh, tube cheese? We you have uh, cheese whiz in a can. Which oh, I really? Some yeah. Dogs like I have one client that uses that all the time with their dog, and she's she reinforces herself sometimes in between. <laughs> she's like spraying cheese in her mouth during our sessions. Yeah, similar sort of concept. Yeah, and it's good to have that little tube you can just stick in the front of the grill and just squeeze yeah. away rather than putting yeah. the fingers in there. That exactly. can still get yeah. yeah. No, something that works well here for me and maybe other people are doing it i don't know i was just looking for because i'll train i'll train any animal but i train a lot of like um uh, primates um larger cats so and i don't like my fingers getting sticky that's a positive punisher for me <laughs> um so i'm always looking for ways to deliver food without actually having to touch it so i will take large syringes like this and cut the tip off of it and just load it with uh, any type of like meat substance, um, like with the bobcat, I'll load that full of elk. And it's nice because you can get just a lick or if yeah. you get a bigger behavior, you can start pushing the syringe a little bit to get a little bit more. Um, so you were talking about cheese whiz and I'm thinking syringe is loaded with meat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They, they're really actually great for like duration reinforcement. So like if I'm, if I need a longer uh, to pull out a little duration, especially in like a husbandry exercise or something or a vet visit. And so what happens in between treats as you go to grab the next one, there's a little space in there where the dog's like, oh wait, now, you know, the vet's on my hind end or whatever. And uh, by using screw tubes or spray cheese or things like that, keeps the dog's focus as we're, um, you know, as the, the husbandry exercise is being done. Yeah. Quincy agrees. I don't know if you can hear it. But, <laughs> yeah. um, no one really likes cheese and hot dog hands, let's be honest. And your hands are covered in treats. <laughs> For sure. So um, when you guys were talking about your approach in um, conditioning, counter conditioning um, the dog to wear a muzzle, um, we've trained our pig to wear a muzzle here. Um, oh, wow. And something else for people who are watching this that work with an array of different animals. Like I'm working on harness training, one of our larger parrots right now. It is, what month is this? February. Um, here in the States, it's, I'm pre-planning. It's going to be very warm in a couple of months. So I'm starting my harness training with this particular bird right now. And a lot of times, um, a lot of times when you're working with fearful animals, when you're working with prey, 
um, when you're working with the individual, I guess is the most important. A lot of times people will reach for that harness and start training. And a lot of times with me, like I showed a live stream yesterday, I didn't even start with the harness. I started preparing the bird for things to come close to your face, things getting ready to go over your head. Um, I worked with another bird particularly, and I just took the leash and touched it to its back, bridge, reinforce, and I was reinforcing with attention. And um, this is a bird, so I, should, I don't even wanna say it's a bird, because I want people to put in whatever animal. This is an animal with a long bite history. Um, a long bite history of animals in close proximity. So I taught this animal, where do I, what I don't want is your mouth opening a beak when mm -hmm. hands are in close proximity. So what do I want you to do instead? And where I started with that particular bird was a head target. And that head target came in so handy yesterday because I was approaching different ways to see, okay, where do, where can I begin with this leash? And immediately the leash comes into the environment and the, bird, and the animal looks up at it and its mouth opened slightly. So I'm like, that's what I don't want. So what do I want the bird to do instead? Very familiar with the head target. The head target means hold. Something's getting ready to happen, but whatever's getting ready to happen, um, I'm gonna take it at your pace and it's gonna be well worth your while. So that's when I just head target, started with the leash and just showed it to them. Bridge and then I reached forward and reinforced with head scratch and some kissing. But it started with the leash uh, on the back. Harness wasn't even involved yet. If you guys are talking about the snaps and the clasps, um, so, I mean, that could be even before getting the harness out, get the animal ready for it. A, a, some, a sound is getting ready to happen, bridge, reinforce. Sure, good example. Yeah, Laura. Um, so we can maybe use like a, like a nose target, similar to dogs, just to get them used to that kind of gesture of putting their heads towards something that they might find uh, threatening, you know, and then introduce a the muzzle fr from there or use the nose touch, as, as Mike said earlier, like a, like a start button. Like a consent test to just then sort of participate in the activity of the muzzle training. I think somebody in your comments had mentioned earlier about you know getting that nose to punch into the back of the muzzle, which is quite an important step, um, and sort of being reluctant to try and put the muzzle towards a face and trying to get a dog to voluntarily participate in coming into the muzzle is quite an important troubleshooting step. It's similar to what you're talking about there. We can maybe train some of those behaviours independent of the muzzle even being there. Just as preparatory work, um, I've used a Costa coffee cup just to get them the sensation of maybe popping their nose into something that's not then the muzzle, which is good if there is negative emotions around the muzzle in the first place, is we're kind of using something similar, but not, not quite the visual of the muzzle. Yeah, I, um, I've been leaning towards using chin rest behaviors, and I know Deb uses that as well. So chin rest, the nice thing about chin rest is that I find you can get longer duration with that versus a nose touch because it's right. more comfortable rather than there the dogs kind of having to put their nose against something. So chin, start with the chin rest behavior and then you obviously gradually build in chin rest to, to the muzzle. So um, yeah, there's, there's so many different ways you can get creative with it. Yeah. Um, indeed. And for those that may be watching and don't understand what chin rest, Mike, do you want to? Yeah, so chin rest, they use that a lot in, um, it's, it's very, it's useful for like husbandry again, vet visits, doing things like that. Um, Laura Monaco Torelli also does a really great job of showing chin rest behaviors uh, with her dog. Uh, but it's it's basically you're, you're getting the dog to rest their chin, and it can be it, generally you can use your hands as the to the target, but you can have the I've seen it done with the dog resting their chin on a certain object or something. Uh, but it just what they're doing is just basically by placing their chin there. And that's where they're stationing. Now, um, and it can also be, as Jim was mentioned, used like sort of a consent test. If the dog's ready, they'll put their chin, but we always give them that option to say, I, I need a break and fine. You're communicating to me that you need a break. So we just let the dog kind of, or animal, <laughs> uh, let us know <laughs> that's the best part of their conversation. And, and so powerful that, though, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, so powerful yeah, that consent, yeah. being able to turn off that pressure mm -hmm. voluntarily. Mm -hmm. It's such a, an elegant way of going about it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, so kind of like a head target, but it's a chin rest. So if you don't, if you don't want 
if you're not comfortable with what's getting ready to happen, you're not going to put your head into the target position. And that is that communication to me. Okay. What's making this animal not comfortable in this situation. Um, when hearing you talk about the chin rest and the consent yesterday with, with working with this animal, um, he was putting his head into the target, but I wasn't really sure he was comfortable. So I asked another behavior, which was uh, he knows to walk to wherever I point. So I pointed my hand on the perch um, and he walked down bridge reinforced. I pointed my hand back because I could get a better read on behavior when I watch him walking side by side. I mean, not side by side, but it, across in front of me. Yeah, I love that because the, another benefit of that is you're reducing the chance of extinction or frustration happening there because you're giving the animal another option that can provide reinforcement, right? Rather than just sticking on this one behavior they're getting uncomfortable with and they're not always getting reinforced for it. And so if you give them another option, you kind of re highly reduce that risk for extinction bursts and frustration coming to play. So, yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And accidentally um, positively punishing the very behavior we're trying to train. Because I found myself, I've done that before, um, where I thought I had an accurate read on behavior mm -hmm. and I was, I ended up pushing the animal past the comfort level. Um, no problem. I can back up and, re and, and train again. But my problem was the animal just had that experience. You know, and, and even if it's paired just that one time, um, and I could see like if I bring out the muzzle again, watch the behavior on the animal. Is this animal showing signs of being as comfortable as he was five minutes ago or yesterday? Um, so I try not to put myself in a position where I have to counter condition anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe how it builds originally with muzzles as well. It goes beyond the point of the animal's tolerance or coping with that particular piece of equipment. So it just builds a version. And the next time they see it, you know, I've got that negative emotion around the muzzle. So that's why the initial phases are so important to get that really positive association and to, to the muzzle. Yeah, I'm just sitting here um, reading through some comments because I, I was backtracking. Um, do you guys care? about discussing some comments that people are sure. making. Sure, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so here's one, I'm scrolling back. Um, Mary Florence says it would be great if vets offered, vet offices offered muzzle training as a service for dogs who could use it. Or it would also be great if vets had, um, and they do, some of them really do, who are really into behavior and want, wanting people not to have to counter condition because they're gonna be the ones in this dog's face the next time it comes in, um, for vets to have a list of references for qualified um, certified trainers that they can refer the training to. Yeah, sure, the principle's great. Um, and I think that sometimes the time constraints on, on a vet can sometimes make that a little bit awkward for them, um, and particularly if you're going to be training muzzle conditioning in a, in a vet practice, maybe isn't the best location to be starting that off, maybe in somewhere where Dan was more familiar and, and, and calmer, um, like, like a home, like a living room type thing, and, and sort of build it up from there, but I completely agree, referring to a, you know, kind of qualified behaviours to work them through on that would definitely be my preference from a vet for sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's, unfortunately, they have so much to concentrate on in that environment and also in the learning. So I was, when I was lecturing at uh, North Carolina State University to the veterinary students there, you know, they were just, when I was talking about muzzles, you know, it was like, everybody was, you know, head was about to explode because they don't, they just don't consider that. They're using quick, you know, the, the slip nylon slip muzzles um, and there's no conditioning at all. But it, what it would be great though, is if they included muzzle conditioning into some of the puppy culture. So when people are yes. getting puppies yes. and the breeders can start off that conversation. We've got great conversations going on about puppy socialization right now and getting those things done. So it'd be great to also include muzzling in that, uh, in that conversation. Yes. Um... Julie says, uh, hang the muzzle on a low kitchen cabinet so it's seen a lot to get them used to seeing it a lot. Um, and something I thought of when reading that comment is you could, if, you know, the dog needs a lot of counter conditioning to a muzzle, 
you could even train the dog to put its own muzzle, its nose into the muzzle. Um, your hands aren't even a part of it yet. Yeah, definitely. Some yeah. of the boxes come where you can turn the muzzle sort of upside down in the box, and that's a good way just to turn it into almost like a food dispensing you know, piece of equipment. And dogs voluntarily going in there and getting food and forming those positive emotions, but on a sort of voluntary basis, some of them do, some of them don't. I think the basketball ones you can turn sort of on their back, and then you're not really in that process. You're allowing the dog to engage with it voluntarily and independently. Yeah, I had a I had a case this American Bulldog uh, years ago that even the sight of a muzzle. So if I, if the owner took anything out that looked like a muzzle, the dog would charge across and bite very severely. Um, wow. So. So fortunately, the Baskervilles had just come out at that time. Um, if I, knowing now what I know now, I would have started with something like a chin rest and not even presented the muzzle. But uh, what we did was just that. We said, okay, we're going to use this like it's a brand new Kong toy. We're going to stuff some peanut butter in there. We're going to set it out and we're going to leave it like it's a new toy and the dog can lick and put their, just kind of put their nose in there to get the, the uh, peanut butter out. So we slowly conditioned for probably a couple months of doing that before we even started to um, go near the dog's face because there's because the dog was a severe bite risk but there's nothing we could do to get a muzzle on a dog at a time so but it went well she did a, she did a wonderful job that client great um funny i'm scrolling through uh, and somebody mentioned about peanut butter at the same time <laughs> with the dog at our show, i started with the muzzle yeah. sitting in a bowl with peanut butter in the bottom mm -hmm. shoved in he shoved his face yeah. so quickly <laughs> and it's always paired with the positive. So then your muzzles on its way to becoming um, a conditioned reinforcer or it's becoming a conditioned reinforcer um, where they'll soon start seeing the muzzle. And instead of um, walking away, eagerly walking towards it. Mm -hmm. That's what we want for sure. I had a similar yeah. case with a border collie that was so avoidant on the muzzle that it was just, it was almost impossible to try and fit it because as soon as, as you say, Mike, anything that came out that resembled the muzzle, straight away you got avoidance, you know, and backing away. Now, this dog didn't have much ag aggression um, in, in, in her, but um, been very much avoidant, you know, and we just back away on sight of the muzzle, which makes it really difficult from close handling um, point of view. So for those dogs, we probably have to work more on their perception of just the muzzle, independent from a handler, just to sort of change that association. and. Peanut butter has many, many applications in dog training. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a conversation going on um, while we're conversing. Um, somebody mentioned, this is kind of backtracking. I'd like to hear some of your approaches to getting animals, you, getting dogs used to that sound um, of a snap in close proximity. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody mentioned, um, can you use a clicker on the back of the neck to start getting them accepting of this sound? Um, Deb says, I'm very careful with this. Some dogs find it quite aversive, mm -hmm. particularly a regular box clicker. Yeah, that snap of the clicker can sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. spook a dog, you know, and if they're not, so, so it would all be about the context in an individual case, I would say on that one, if a dog's familiar with a clicker and you know, has a positive association to it than, than, than possibly, but certainly not fully hearing it for the first time or anything that can really spook a dog. Yeah, I'm always careful with the, just like any other provocative stimulus, the distance and the intensity of the stimulus. So if I'm going to start conditioning something, I will have the dog way across the other side of the room. And I will, some dogs you have to even muff, like use something yeah. to like muffle the sounds so you put inside a towel and then you make that yeah. sound. And then of course, you know, you pair it with the, with, food or whatever you're using um, and then you gradually increase the intensity of it so you might remove the towel it's still at a distance and then you start reducing the distance over time so just like any anything else we would condition um, we got to be careful and sometimes we just change the equipment <laughs> sometimes we start we just start with a different type of muzzle or a different you know you, you get some of these the older baskets with the with the buckle straps versus having to hear that sound so sometimes it's easier that the quicker fix is just to switch the equipment yeah for yeah. sure uh, yeah, I think it sometimes can be the gesture as well. You know, if a dog has, mm -hmm. you know, particularly negative experiences with the muzzle, then sometimes that those hands, those human hands coming around to clasp it on, is sometimes they're anticipating that happening, yeah. and that's where you maybe see some difficulty trying to get it the final stages yeah. of getting it on to, to acclimatize it. One little trick too that I use is that um, if the if there's a buckle clasp on the t um, any whatever equipment, whether it's a harness, a, a collar, or a muzzle that we're trying to put on, um, I start just on this, so I start like really on that, so it's wide open. 
and I teach the dog to, you know, put their, you know, put this on this way rather than me reaching around. That way, when I do need to tighten it, it's already it's already pre laced. So in other words, I just have to do this. So it's a lot easier for the dog in the sense that I don't have to reach around with two hands and fiddle around with it. And, you know, putting this, putting these old Baskervilles on, it's like putting on a tuxedo. It takes so, so many steps to it. So if it's already pre-laced, you can just simply tie it that way. So, Great tip. Yeah. Love that, Mike. Yeah, love that. I love that. Um, we're, I'm currently harness training two lemurs that we have here. And I was trying to figure out how to approach. So and I, I, I started, I did start with the actual harness. Um, touching the animal, but then when I, where I found myself, I'm like, that I had to stop is the animal puts his head through the harness, <clears throat> excuse me, puts the head through the harness. Then I need to reach behind because I've been doing all this work with one hand, mm. with just with one hand yeah. and the reinforcement delivery from the left hand. So when it came time that the lemurs were putting their head through the harness, then I went to grab and reach behind them. And so I found I had to do it with one hand, but then I'm like, how am I going to get to this clasp? Because I need to, um, I need to now take both hands and go behind the animal. Um, so there was some extra work for me to do there with saying that, um, are there, can you give the viewers any tips on, what behaviors to watch for when training this that your dog may not be comfortable with what with your approaches just to prevent having to counter condition sure sure avoidance would probably be the biggest marker for me so any distance increase in behavior that you see is probably an indication that there's the dogs feeling threatened you know under those conditions so that may mean the muzzle itself or the gestures that we just spoke about and i think it's quite hard for some dogs to have as we were saying, have those two hands come around, you know, and that can be quite intimidating. And if you're seeing any avoidance, backing away, that type of thing, any rigid body language, then um, it may indicate that there's, there's a version built in there. Yeah, yeah. Similarly, I, well, a tip I give my clients is don't move. Let the dog move, you know, because that's going to allow them that you know, the, that's the, you're giving them that part of the conversation. You know, you want to move towards it, great. I'll reinforce you with that. You want to move away from it? Great. I'm going to let you do that. And yeah. you know, the reinforcement happens when you approach. And so you let the, the dog kind of uh, dictate the conversation. And that, I find that really helpful. Clients just stop, stop moving so much because they just start to like put, you know, all this movement and trying to get things yeah. on or rush things really can make it go. In lots going on, isn't there? Some things, yeah. lots going on with it. Yeah. yeah. And I think with the, with some owners and they're so keen to try and help their dog and, and maybe impress in the session that they're, kind of you know pushing the dog over threshold essentially mm -hmm. or just rushing mm -hmm. it a little bit yeah 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 daphne also says yes let them control their space Perfect. so um a, just a key for people who might start um trying to work with this <clears throat> let your dog back away that's a cue that it may not be comfortable um for a dog say that may it might be a little harder to read behaviors um what are some more subtle signs say like the dog isn't backing away but i know jim you mentioned rigid what are some other things people cues people can look for from their dog that it might be nervous might not be comfortable but yet it's not backing away from them sure so you might see wheel eye you know a sort of side eye i can really anxious kind of look at you you may be seeing a lot of lip licking the more subtle signs that are not about creating distance but are communicating that you know the animal's under stress um, and you know, those are probably good markers and maybe if the dog is rigid in position with a sort of frozen tail then maybe a good indicator that they're not coping particularly well the intensity is too too high sometimes the way they're taking the treats out the bottom of the muzzle can be a good indicator mm -hmm. if they normally take them nice and calmly and then they're all of a sudden very grabby that's a very good indicator that they're under under stress, I would say. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got you got pretty, pretty well, didn't you? <laughs> There's an animal here. Yeah, another animal. Um Rachel Saunders says maybe the dog is yawning. That mm -hmm. could be one. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um there's an animal here particularly. A lot of our training here in the beginning stages is all off contact. 
off contact until you learn that animal's individual behaviors um, and when it does these particular behaviors. There's one here in particular that, and I will ask the volunteers, what is that animal doing right now? And if they say nothing, I'll say it's doing something because it's getting ready to attack you. <laughs> um, there's cage bars here, but the behavior that I want to say that I think is relative across a lot of species is this animal will stiffen up, not move, and nothing moves but his eyes. Um, that's a clear, that's clear communication. You're getting ready to be bitten. Yeah. Yeah. My mm -hmm. colleague, uh, Trish McMillan, and I always say that in our seminars, we love dogs who breathe. <laughs> because when they stop breathing, it's usually yeah. a bad thing. <laughs> um, so I know, I mean, we're coming up on the hour. Um, before I show your uh, websites again, um, what are if what are some other things that people can train before they start the muzzle training to get the animal used to this kind of interaction communication? Sure. Um, I think just general reward-based training, like marker training, incorporating that into some form of training prior to muzzle would be good communication. You know, it would establish relationship, you know, and criteria for earning reinforcement. Um, so probably having some form of reward marker, whether it's a clicker or the word yes, or whatever you choose to use, having that prepared and in play, I would say would be quite important for going through the process. Yeah, I think um, I think learning just how to get a good conditioned emotional response yeah. and explaining that. So clients obviously don't know what that means. Most of them don't know what that means at first. So I just explained, you know, what does your dog do when you take out the leash? If it likes walks, what does your dog do when it hears you go to the treat cabinet and wrinkle that, you know, crinkle that treat bag? Uh, and they answer, oh, well, the dog comes running and they love it. And so I said, that's what you want to do with the muzzle. Yeah. Yes. You want that conditioned. And if you can get good at that in other aspects, then you're going to get good at it with pretty much all the issues that we're having in most of these cases. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll tell people um, a lot of times, if you're not familiar with the individual animal, I'll do like a target stick training. Um, and introduce that. I mean, and so many people are like, oh, the target sticks like a magic wand. It's not a magic wand. It's science, it's contingency, it's conditioning. Yeah. That magic wand usually comes out no other time, but when it's time for a nose target. If I don't understand an animal, if I think I understand an animal, and I wanna make sure I really understand an animal, because I work with a lot of animals that um, can do some serious bodily injury really fast. I'm doing all off contact training in the beginning and I'll teach that nose target and I'll teach that nose target here. I'll teach it up here. I'll teach it down here. I'll teach it to turn your head to the side. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I'm looking for is what other behaviors are happening. How is your body moving in different ways when you're touching that nose target? Cause those are going to give signs to me that, that rid that rigidity is coming in again. Okay. I am nowhere near touching this animal yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, great information, you guys. I know what I'm doing the rest of the day. <laughs> 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 um, and I'm going to go to your websites, both of your websites, with gems I've been on yours many times, um, and look for your information. So to find... Um, Michael Shikashio, uh, more information about him and the great work he's doing, aggressivedog.com. Um, to find Jim and the amazing work he's doing, cbtdogbehavior.com. Are you both on um, social media? Sure. Heavily. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. <laughs> Too much. We can find you both on Facebook, Instagram. Mm -hmm. Any other any additional? A little bit of YouTube for me. I haven't I haven't updated it in a while, but I have some videos there too. That's under aggressive dog or at, at aggressive dog on YouTube and uh, similarly Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Michael Shikashi on Instagram. Okay. 
Um, and we also have the muzzleupproject.com. Mm -hmm. yep. You can also follow Muzzle Up Project on Instagram. Um, and you both have a specialty in working with dogs labeled as aggressive, correct? Sure. That's all, all Mike, that's all you work with, isn't it? Aggression cases. That's, that's all I'd see, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's okay. brief. Uh, <laughs> credit to you. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to show a couple slides before we end. Um, for those of you that follow the work that I do, we have an upcoming animal behavior and training workshop. This is focusing um, on all species. Um, we have several zookeepers coming that will be in Chicago. Um, and this is part of Dr. Jason Crean's um, course every year on zoo genetics and biology. Um, you can also, coming up in a couple of weeks, I'll be speaking at the Featherfest Connecticut wow. Parrot Expo. Um, and then we have our zoo workshop coming up um, in June. We just announced it. <clears throat> it's half sold out. So if you want your spot, get it quickly. Um, like I said, the Animal Behavior Center has just celebrated its seventh anniversary on Friday. Um, Stan I Can Foundation is our nonprofit that we started um, as uh, a memorial to an animal that we lost. Sam I Can Foundation is really helping people understand and, and empower those animals. And we just recently raised $2,500 in one day for the amazing Nancy Forrester from, of Nancy Forrester Secret Garden in Key West. So I want to get a shout out to everybody that helped us make this happen. Jim, Mike, thank you so much. This has been an amazing episode, and your cat thinks so too. <laughs> that's, that's fine. <laughs> I should have this on Appreciate that. Um, I would love to have you both come on um, again in the future. Um, feel free to, once the live stream is over, There's there was a lot of questions, comments that I couldn't get to. You both feel free to go in and um, answer them. Um, I'm going to make sure your websites are up for everybody to see. Great. Thank Great. you. Thanks Great. You're very welcome. Thank you both. See you Take soon. care, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.